Okay, so it's about a king who is getting to uh, an age where he feels like he will not be able to rule anymore, or other people feel that he will not be able to effectively rule anymore. So he needs to um, have a living will. Like it can't just be that he dies and then they, you know, cut apart the kingdom and give certain people certain things. This has to be something that is prepared for early, and it has to be something that kind of happens before he dies then to kind of pave the way for the next ruler. So he has three daughters. He has a daughter named Goneril, a daughter named Reagan, and a daughter named Cordelia. And he's going to decide who gets what property based on how much his daughters love him. So he's like, set it up with this favorite child question, basically. And I'm going to give the favorite child the most and, and so on. And you earn favor by loving me the most. So that's the premise of this thing. Um, and you're going to see sort of these instincts or this base nature that we've been talking about in terms of wills, you're going to see that pop up in different characters throughout the play. But what's super interesting about it is that the guy whose will it is, is observing it as it happens. So it's not, it doesn't happen after his death. He has to witness how people are going to react to his objects and his wealth and his power that he's passing on. Um, so I'm going to give you a little bit of background on this because it's going to explain some of the themes. So it's written in, most Shakespeare, we're not totally sure exactly what it's written. It's written sometime between 1603 and 1606. Um, we know that it was written by here because there was like a really prominent production. But that doesn't mean that there weren't smaller productions beforehand or that Shakespeare had, hadn't written it. Um, earlier. So it's, but it's sometime in between that time period. And the reason that is important is because a, an important English ruler died in 1603. So it's really important to kind of like know that it's right around that time period. So basically in England, and I'm no English history expert, but basically um, from 15, uh, no, from, uh, I don't remember when, Henry VIII. Do you guys remember when Henry VIII was king? whatever, for like a hundred years, there was a bunch of unrest in England um, because they were kept switching religions, kept switching from uh, Protestantism to Catholicism based on the ruler. And every time a new ruler with a new kind of uh, religious preference came in, um, it upset the whole country and they all had to like switch religions in order to show loyalty to the king and, and the country. And so there was just a lot of like political and religious upheaval. And then Queen Elizabeth, becomes queen in 1558. And she kind of, she helped um, calm things down for a little bit. She ruled for a very long time, 1558 to 1603. So Elizabeth dies in 1603. And um, it was a little bit of like a, I mean, she was really successful. So she was associated with, with the British Renaissance, a whole bunch of great art and uh, great literature was made in the Elizabethan era. Um, she was like very strong for, for a ruler and she felt like the people felt like she kind of like united the country. Um, and it was kind of a feminist moment for the country too, because they saw that a female ruler could be just as effective as a male ruler. And in fact, more so because she was much better than Henry VIII. Um, so people were like, oh, queens can be in charge just as legitimately as kings. Um, and so she was, she dies in 1603 and she's the last of like the Tudor family of, you've heard of the Tudors, right? Maybe, They're, anyway, a bunch of rulers that were part of the Tudor clan. Um, she, she's the last of them. So not only do you have a switchover of rulers at the time, but you also have a switchover of um, families to rule too. That means Elizabeth didn't have heirs. So Elizabeth got to just appoint who she thinks would be the next one. And she appoints James the first. Um, and this started, so this was the Elizabethan era. This started the Jacobin. Jacobian era. And James was an interesting guy. He was like, a, he was like kind of a spiritualist. Um, he believed in demons and witches and uh, lots of supernatural things. And he also believed that the kings have a divine right to rule. So it's not just that they've been politically appointed, but that God has appointed them through, you know, through God's puppeteering kind of, God has made 
James the King. And so whatever James said should be kind of, kind of like the Pope. It should be respected as though it is the word of God, basically, because God appointed him king. So obviously God is going to approve of the things that he does as king. And uh, that did not go over super well in history. And it kind of leads to, I mean, among other things, but it leads to the English Civil War, which goes from 1642 to 1651. So you kind of see the timeline here. Elizabeth dies 1603, which is when uh, Shakespeare maybe wrote King Lear, or started to write King Lear. Um, and 1603 to 1606 is that transition of power from somebody very politically capable and interested in the arts to somebody um, that is kind of a little bit more superstitious. Um, and I, I, I hesitate to use that word because I don't want to ever denigrate anyone's religious, but religion, but like believes in demons and ghosts and witches and so on. Um, and uh, also believed in divinity as his right rather than po politics as his right. All right, so that's kind of the historical background of it. So Shakespeare, with that, living in that time period, writes a play about a king who believes in his own divine rights. It seems like really politically risky to me, honestly. Um, but he was able to, to couch it a little bit, hide it a little bit, because it was based on a real king. So it was based on this um, Brythonic, this ancient king um, named Lear. He spelled it this way, though. Who was probably from around 15... 87 uh, was when, oh, sorry, this was when the story, the legend first appeared. Legend appears. Um, but it's kind of like the King Arthur legend, like people aren't totally clear when this guy actually lived, if he did at all, but people kind of think it's sometime in the 12th century. So he bases his story on like ancient, ancient Britain, right? He's not necessarily, um, it's not a contemporary story, it's historical fiction. Um, and then he also adds in a subplot with characters that he completely invents. Um, it's a lot like Arthurian legend where you could do a lot with it because no one totally agrees what the truth was. So he plays with it quite a bit. But that kind of hid the fact that maybe he was talking about James all along. Um, but yeah, okay. So uh, the other thing you need to know is that there were two versions of the play printed and there are lots of controversies over which one is actually Shakespeare's. So there was one in 1808 that appeared in one kind of set of his plays, and then there was one in 16, sorry, 1608, one in 1623. This is usually the one um, that gets printed. This one was in what's called the folios. Have anybody ever seen the folios? I think there's a long shot, but we had them at the University of Utah library for a little while, which was very cool. There's only a few of them. Um, but anyway, this is printed in the folios, and, and usually those were more accessible, so this was the one that got disseminated the most. Um, but in our version that I printed for you, the stuff that is added in 1623 is in brackets. So when you see the brackets, that means that this was like an edit. And people argue, was this Shakespeare editing his own work? Or was this later writers trying to uh, fix Shakespeare? Which people say then, well, then we should stick with the original, right? Not the, not the edited version. And there's lots of arguments about it. Um, OK. So that's King Lear. Now, before we start reading it, though, we need to talk about the genre. There's lots of me talking today, by the way. Sorry about that. So we're going to talk about tragedy, because this is a tragedy. Automatically, if it's a tragedy, a Shakespearean tragedy, you know someone's going to die at the end. In fact, most of them will die at the end. So, spoiler alert, <laughs> they all die. Um, that's, a, that's kind of like the <laughs> one thing to know about tragedy. But the word tragedy, it comes from, actually, just our, what we know of tragedy. Aristotle's book, Poetics. So this is a super influential book in literary studies, Aristotle's Poetics. In it, he talks about the differences between tragedy and comedy. 
and he addresses a really central question that the Greeks were talking about at the time. The Greeks were asking, is it okay to include immoral behavior in art? So Plato and Socrates, they said no. They were really upset by the way, like especially that the gods had been represented in Greek mythology, like in the Iliad or in uh, the Odyssey. They're like, why are we presenting people with these immoral gods who behave so badly? Everyone's going to read this and then mimic what they read in the books and they're going to start behaving badly themselves. And Aristotle said, no, that is not the case. People can read something and discover Aristotle says it is totally fine to have immoral behavior, fine and good even, because people will read it and discover internal themes about how to behave well. People will learn from stories. That seems like a given now, but that was a debate at the time. So people are gonna learn from stories and it is going to cause them to become better people if they read about immoral behavior, as long as the like themes around it are moral, right? Um, and he says then one of the best ways to teach people these moral themes is through tragedy. He says storytellers use what's called mimesis, which is an imitation of life. And by, by mining, that's how you remember my thesis, by mining what they see, by kind of taking what they see in the real world and uh, translating that into a play or a poem for him, it was a way of um, creating with tragedy a feeling of pity and fear. So as you're reading a tragedy, you feel really sorry for the characters and you feel really anxious for them. That's the, that's the fear part of it. It could also work with a horror, like you actually do fear whatever is happening in that. Um, but you get pity and fear because you recognize the truth of the play. You recognize that that play is an imitation of life. If you do not believe that these things could actually happen to people, then you're not going to feel sorry for them or feel fear about it because you're like, well, you know, this is so far removed from experience that we don't need to be scared of this. He said, but that recognition is what causes the tragedy. It causes you to like tear up when you read a certain scene or get choked up, right? It's because you recognize it. Um, and there's a few things to know about tragedy here. He says that the character in tragedy is determined by his actions. Sometimes we'll have debates. What, what can you trust most about a person? Can you trust the things they say or can you trust the things that they do, right? The, 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 I forgot that saying, follow. Could be that one, perfect, let's stick with that one. <laughs> I can speak louder than words for Aristotle, for sure. Um, the, the place he was talking about did not include a whole lot of interiority. Like in the Iliad, you never hear one of the characters like thinking to themselves. It's all spoken um, and it's all based on what they then actually do. And that's how you determine whether somebody is a good person or a bad person, it's based on their actions. So it doesn't really matter what they spew off in a monologue, what matters is what they do afterwards and that builds up a character um, and this character then has to have a kind of arc in a tragedy and the arc occurs in two ways one there can be peripatia i'm teaching you a new word today maybe some of you know peripatia peripatia is when your actions change so you achieve the character arc when the actions change. Um, and this can be something where uh, it is characters are subject to fate. So if someone dies in the book, that's a peripatia. If somebody uh, murders somebody else, that's peripatia. When the actions change from one second to the other, it kind of changes the whole state of the character. The other kind of, of arc that you can create is through 
agnoresis. And, and I can't ever say this. Anagnorisis. 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 Which is another way of saying recognition. Sorry. Peripatia means, it translates as reversal of situation. So someone's ch situation changes from one moment to the next based on fate. Agna anagnorisis is a reversal of um, your mind state. So you change from ignorance to knowledge. Um, maybe you think you're going through the whole play and you think that your, let's say you're a leader, you think that your actions are based on your choices. Like I'm doing this because I have free will and I choose to do this thing. But recognition is when you realize that there might be a reversal of situation and you accept that you're not fully in charge of the things that you do. But really, that's how Aristotle thought recognition had to happen. But really we use it now to say that this recognition character arc is any time the character gains like a significant piece of knowledge that changes the course of their actions and the course of their character then. All right, through all of this, the writer is going for fear and pity. That's what they want to create in the, with tragedy, that's what they want to create in the audience. I want you to feel pity for my characters and I want you to be afraid for them, right? Um, but that's not where Aristotle thinks tragedy ends. It's not like you close the play and you're like, well, life is pointless and I'm sad all the time and anxious all the time. What he was saying is that you do all of this for the purpose of catharsis, which is like a purging of emotions. And I think this is really how horror works a lot of times. Like I love watching horror movies and I'm also a very anxious person. And I think that might be part of it. I can watch the horror movie and I can be anxious for an hour and a half, just really, really kind of like my, my adrenaline's going, my heart's pumping because I legitimately get scared at these movies. Um, but by the end of it, even if everyone in the movie dies, even if it's like a horrible ending, by the end, just the process of making those fears visible in front of me on the screen causes that purging of emotions so that we're supposed to if tragedy is working well we're supposed to get rid of all these negative feelings through the process of watching it it's maybe part of the reason that we like sad stories or we like scary stories um, so that's kind of the ultimate goal this cleansing of the emotions cleansing of like really passionate emotions especially all right, there's a couple more things to include about tragedy because this is Aristotle's version of tragedy. Shakespeare has a couple things associated with him that makes his tragedies. Someone important always dies in his plays. There is always some kind of tragic flaw or error in the main character. And this one's really important. His tragedy is always about important, great people. So it's not, it's not about like, um, his tragedies are not about just like the common everyday man. They're always about people who are really important to the country, really great, like have a lot of power because he wants to show how these, um, their actions ripple. So when they make actions, when they have these character arcs, it affects far more people than just themselves. Comedy is the opposite of that. Comedy, it's like, it's the everyday person and they realize that their actions are not important. <laughs> In tragedy, you realize your actions are important. Okay.